light of infinite. The part of poetry that I love the most, beyond spinning words and thoughts into what sounds like spaces I would want to travel, is that much like visual art, the reader interprets it in the way that they want, or may need to in the moment, and takes away what they may. This week's poem goes something like this. Amazing how a day dreams from night through might. Light brings darkness dependent on its contrast. First love, last to last, but closer to you, being the only answer to a question you've only been guessing. Inward lies the truth. This week, we near the end of Svirat to Omer, the counting of the days between Pesach and Shavuot. This counting is meant to prepare us to receive the living Torah on Shavuot. It's our ascendance to what the Kabbalah calls the 50th gate, the gate of understanding, of Binah. As we ascend, we are finding that we all have a nefesh elokit, a part of God within us. So the truth lies within each of us. We just need to transcend the layers of doubt and unlock the powerful truth and redemption that awaits. All this begins with Pesach, which in Likutei Lachot is explained as Pesach, literally a talking mouth. This means that the only way to reach the upper levels of holiness is through speech, through tefillah, prayer, and true calling out to Hashem, to God. The blessings you receive correlate to the words that you speak. This is the power of counting out loud with the blessings of Svirat Omer. The opening verse of this week's parasha Bamidbar reads, Be'daber Hashem el Moshe Bamidbar, and God spoke to Moshe in the desert. The word Midbar, desert, and Dibur, speech, share the same root. Speech represents freedom, and the desert landscape is a metaphor for freedom. It's a place where the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, showed most clearly to Moshe, at the burning bush and at Mount Sinai, and to the children of Israel in the Ananea Kavod, the clouds of glory, and countless other examples. The desert is a place without distraction, where humility lives. It's a place where the dance with the Divine Consciousness paves the path to unification. This week we start the fourth book of the Torah, Bamidbar, which means in the wilderness or in the desert, and covers the continuing journey of the Jews in the desert after the revelation at Sinai. In English, however, we call this book Numbers, and while we count the days leading up to receiving the Torah, we learn that Moshe and Aaron are instructed to count the Jewish people in the Sinai desert, and so the book is known simply as Numbers. At this point in the narrative, there have only been two censuses taken. But this one is different. The census is taken of the 12 tribes of Israel. Moshe counts 603,550 men between the ages of 20 and 60 years old, while the tribe of Levi are counted separately and number 22,300 men, ages one month and older. Count the heads of the entire assembly of the children of Israel. Rashi explains the powerful verse as Hashem choosing to count the Jews to demonstrate his love for them. But with everything in this world, there's a balance, the potential for good and the potential for bad. The verse is translated as count the heads, but literally means raise the heads. This fits nicely with Rashi's interpretation because the count is meant to elevate the Jewish people and ascribe greatness to them. The other end of this, though, is where the Midrash comes in, pointing out that the same word can also mean remove the heads, which has been seen previously in Breshid in Genesis. Pharaoh will remove your head from you and hang you on a tree. We are meant to learn from here that the men counted in the census were originally destined to die in the desert as a punishment for the sin of the spies. But instead of that descent, there was an ascent, and Hashem counted his precious children. We read, as Hashem had commanded Moshe, he counted them. One might think that Moshe had counted the men as one would determine its military strength or some other strategic purpose. But it's clear that he did not do it of his own accord, only because Hashem had requested that he do so. Other people take censuses in order to be prepared for what battles may come. But this does not apply to the Jewish people, who have emunah and Hashem, who have full faith in God, who will protect them regardless of the size of their army, as we have seen time and again throughout the wars waged against the children of Israel. Counting them had no other purpose but elevation and appreciation, much like we would count anything precious to us. Some argue that the counting was to determine the number of people in each tribe, in order to divide the land in a fair manner. They say that the sin of the spies had not yet happened when the count took place, so it must have been intended for fair division of the land. But of course Hashem knew that the sin would happen, and that the generation would not enter the land of Israel. Knowing that they would sin and die in the desert, their heads would be removed. Hashem chose to elevate and raise their heads instead. After all, they and their children are still to be the collective children of Israel, the chosen people, saved from exile in Egypt, and brought through the desert and given the promised land, Israel. The world in its entirety was created just for you. When a person is being counted, they can look at it as if they themselves are so precious that they are being treasured in this way. 
or they could think that they don't matter much as individuals and what they do doesn't matter because they're only being counted as part of a group, insignificant in comparison to the whole. Balbim's Eretz Chemda explains that each person is always both an individual and a part of a whole. Each and every one of us is a complete world, a microcosm of the whole. And we also share in the whole, like the stars to which we are compared. The stars taken all together are a unit, but each star is a world unto itself. As it says in Yeshayahu, who brings forth their army in number and calls to all of them by name. The Lubavitcher Rebbe elaborates on Rashi's point that the counting was done to show Hashem's love for us, saying that Hashem's focus has to have been on the part of us that is equal, which is our essence, our Jewish soul. The point of the census was to bring the soul to our awareness. The Rebbe also explains the difference between this third census and the first two. The first was when Moshe counted the Israelites when they went out of Egypt identified each person who had made the courageous self-sacrifice, following the word of Hashem into the wilderness. Moshe again counted the Israelites when the Mishkan, the tabernacle, was built. The count and construction was done through the Bekah, half-shekel donation, which touched on both the intellect and the emotion of the Israelites. As they prepared for the work, they would bring the Shekhinah, the divine presence, down. Hashem commanded them and the Israelites followed. The third count was different, though, because Moshe and Aaron both counted, and the Israelites by their own emotion and action in the service of the Mishkan brought Hashem into their midst. They created a union of their individual and collective Jewish souls with Hashem. As we read, take from among you an offering for Hashem. Whoever is generous of heart shall bring the offering of Hashem to contribute to building the Mishkan. In Judaism, heart and action are intertwined. So every wise-hearted man among you shall come and do, creating excitations from below, through generosity drawn forth from above. This emotional and physical contribution creates a reciprocal relationship between God and man, and this is how Hashem's glory filled the Mishkan. In an often quoted Mishnah from Mishnah Sanhedrin, it says, Every human being is unique, and every human being is a copy of the prototype human being, Adam. Therefore, every human being, for my sake, the world was created. In Judaism, we believe that every being was created in the image and likeness of God. And from the same Mishnah, Chazal, our sages teach that every life is like an entire universe. It's when our soul enters our body that this becomes true. A body without a soul is similar to any other, but when the awareness of the soul as part of the body is recognized by an individual, he or she can begin to live out one's purpose. Their potential to be an entire universe becomes apparent. To use the body, the finite, to spiritualize reality and to fulfill the light of the infinite, that is when the body is a vessel for the soul. The realization can take a person from a physical and spiritual desert, Midbar, to a spiritual and physical promised land, Israel. So just as the verse can be interpreted as a descent or an ascent, and a head looking down or being lifted up, so too it's true for the individual being counted, and how they could walk away from that feeling insignificant or walk away feeling uplifted. The Mishnah comes to teach the importance of each individual so much so that each person is their own universe. The Torah describes the Jewish people as ish echad belev echad, one person with one heart, so even if we are being counted individually, we can't view ourselves as separate entities. We are all essential in the wholeness of ourselves as a people viewed as one body. Just as a body is made up of countless elements that work in concert, so too we as a people made up of individuals that contribute to the whole of the nation. And because of this, in truth, and if we could be on the level of feeling in such a way, when one of us is hurting, we are all hurting. Just as when one part of our own body hurts, the entire body is affected. We can only be shalem, whole, complete, when we are all redeemed, when none of us is hurting. Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah, required 600,000 Jews to be present. Rashi goes so far as to say that even if one person was missing, even the least significant from the tribe of Dan, Hashem would not have given the Torah. And we see this with the Torah itself. If even one letter of the Torah scroll is written incorrectly, missing or incomplete in any way, the entire Torah is rendered invalid. Humility is important. Moshe was said to be the most humble person in the world, but that humility wasn't a false sense of insignificance. He spoke to Hashem, he led the Jewish people, he knew how powerful he was, but he was humble because he believed that if someone else had been given the same talents and the same task, they might have done a better job than he had done. The Baal Shem Tov taught that humility in the wrong place will cause you to block your own and other people's blessings. If one thinks, who am I to do this good deed? What difference would it make? Who am I to pray for my friend? I am insignificant. That person would be blocking the blessings and goodness that can come to them and through them. 
However, humility in the right place brings abundant blessing. Picture a rich person who invites everyone to his parties but spends the entire time talking about how rich and incredible he is. Everyone would leave being jealous and having ill feelings towards him, bringing negative thought and potentially negative actions towards him. Now picture that same person opening up their home, offering all that they had in a humble and loving and giving way. Everyone would leave feeling positive and thankful that such an individual is blessed with such treasures because they are using it in such a way to give to others. His guests would not only feel uplifted and inspired, but with feelings of hope that this person can continue to do good and provide in such a way. To further this point, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov told a colleague, Rabbi Udo, that praying for a friend keeps a person from arrogance. Rabbi Udo questioned the statement by pointing out that it would seem that one would become more arrogant by praying for a friend, because the implication is that the person praying is more important to God than the friend. The Rebbe answered him with a story. There was a king who was angry with his son, and he sent him away. Afterwards, the prince placated his father, who agreed to have him back. This same thing happened several times, until at last the king was so angry that not only did he send his son away, but he also told one of the ministers that if the prince were to come along wanting to placate him, the minister should not allow him to enter. The minister obeyed, but he saw how much the prince was suffering because he could not get to his father to placate him. The minister realized that the king was also suffering, and he said to himself, Surely I am the cause of all this, since I am the barrier between them. I myself will go to the king and beg him to forgive the prince and allow him back. The minister did exactly that, and the king immediately agreed. The meaning of this story is obvious. Whenever a friend of ours is suffering, physically or spiritually, we should say, without a doubt, my sins are the cause of all this. The Holy One, blessed be he, constantly desires to bestow blessings of goodness upon his children. But my sins are a barrier holding all this back. The solution for me is to plead with the king on behalf of my friend. When a person thinks like this, he will certainly not become arrogant. The root of arrogance is when a person prides himself on having qualities that his friend lacks. But when a person believes that the only cause of his friend's deficiencies, spiritual or material, is the screen he himself has erected between his friends and the Holy One, blessed be he, who wants to bestow blessings at all times, then he will certainly not become arrogant. On the contrary, his pride will be broken and he will come to genuine humility. My dad was a chaplain and a rabbi in the Navy. He traveled all over, and on occasion, he would bump into Rabbi Shlomo Karlbach. Karlbach would tell him about the word shalom. He said, how can you say shalom when you first meet someone and the same word when you say goodbye? Shalom comes from shalem, completeness. I was incomplete until I met you, but now that I met you, I am more complete than before. But now that you are leaving, you are taking something away from me. And I say shalom in hopes that someday you will come back and make me more complete again. We are all made in the image of Hashem, and with each positive interaction, we see another piece of Hashem and we feel more complete. The first census coincides with Pesach, a time when revelation comes from above. Hashem's love and mercy towards us is shown, but not by our own action or merit. After this period comes the Omer, a time of sacrifice, a time that the Rebbe calls the revelation that comes from below, when through Hashem's grace, our own merits brings forth the Torah that will be revealed on Shavuot. The third census involved not just Moshe, but Aaron too. Whereas Moshe is Hashem's channel for revelation from above, Aaron the priest elevates Israel from below. It's through this census that the Jews become aware not only of the blessings from above, but of the potential to unify with the divine from below. And that is what prepares us for Shavuot and to receive the Torah. In this time of counting, we realize that each day is a new beginning, a new opportunity to dance with the divine.